I'll, I'll start with a couple of questions. Um, in the introduction, you talked about how this is, it existed for a while as a, as a television version, 55 minute. So how different was that version from, from this film? Well, um, it was different in two ways. First of all, they asked us to eliminate all uh, things that related to personal relations. So there were basically no characters. There were an explanation of, of, these, of, of these fishing techniques. And uh, they also asked us to eliminate some scenes that they thought gave a bad image of fishermen. For instance, this character that doesn't know how to swim. They, they told me that's something you cannot show because, of course, fishermen know how to swim. This is something you, you're not supposed to show. So basically, it was something really technical with more fishing scenes than you have here uh, and more detail about how they fish. Uh, and basically almost no uh, presence of the characters. What about your presence and Nuno's presence? Was, the, was there a voiceover in the television version? Uh, there was a voiceover, but it was um, a different one. A different one, a technical voiceover, let's say, explaining how they do this, how they do that, exactly. Uh, more or less the technical details of uh, each fishing uh, technique or craft. It's actually it's quite interesting because some of the things you see here they don't exist anymore they totally disappeared so um, yeah but I, I don't think that the fact that showing it in more detail is really helpful because uh, maybe for somebody who studies fishing uh, but uh, if you don't get any involvement with the with the situation I think it's uh, uh, very dry. Yeah. It's interesting that you know, I mean, this is obviously footage that you shot um, nearly 15 years ago, but there's, as you were saying, there's a choice not to really talk about today, to, to talk about like what's, you know, because what I, I think people might be curious, like what's, what is the state of small scale fishing, fishing and also like what's happened to these characters. And I mean, if, to do it seriously, if we wanted to, uh, to a sort of a, um, a balance of what happened between, uh, we would have to shoot more. We would have to go back and uh, just to say uh, a few things about these people wouldn't really uh, be the, the, but the, actually it changed a lot. First of all, um, even, the, even the landscape changed. What you see here doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they did uh, uh, a very large harbor with uh, EU funds for larger boats uh, against the will of the fishermen. They, actually, their idea was that wasn't the right way to, to build it. So you, they can't take the, the boats out of the water anymore. All that part has been destroyed. So either they have larger boats or uh, they can't fish. So uh, you have probably less people fishing, and you have uh, bigger boats nowadays with electronic, uh, many of these boats uh, disappeared. And also, uh, there's been a, a huge drop in, uh, in catches. From uh, I was with Pedro, the main character that you see here, he goes on fishing. The film was shown for the first time in Berlin, and he was with us, with us in Berlin, so we stayed together for two or four days. So we could go in detail, you could mm. tell me uh, in detail how the thing is today. And actually they cannot get any fish uh, as close to the island as they did before. So now when he leaves, he leaves all, uh, always three or four days in a row, so he can just go and come back. So he must go, he must go much uh, further away. Yeah. And um, of course he had to change the boat, so now he has a boat which is uh, protected, not not open, like like you see here. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about the the voiceover in the film, the process of sort of, of, of writing it, and it it's such a big part of this film and of what now remind me, and I think it's a big part of what makes these films so so rich and so expansive in a way. 
Um, well, the, the voiceover here was more or less written as a, uh, I would say, a, not really a dialogue, but uh, uh, because it's two people actually, it's me and Nunu, and uh, so it's like if we're talking with each other, and some, so we wrote it together. Some things were uh, my contributions, other things were his ideas, and we wanted to keep keep it in the sort of dialogue that we all uh, that we also had during the shooting. Actually, I had it's very strange because I had uh, we had to go back to the, the original material to to do this version because uh, we had lost uh, the editing project. The, the file. Final Cut project. We didn't have the discs anymore, and I had forgotten a lot of things. He had Nuno had, had a very uh, clear memory of uh, what was uh, what we had in the tapes. For instance, I I I, uh, I had this idea we we're going to spend uh, two weeks looking at things, and he told me, "No, we will see. It's going to go very fast because uh, I know where everything, where each thing is." But maybe this also has to do with the fact that while I was shooting, I was doing, the, at the time, the first treatments for uh, hepatitis C, uh, who were on an, an experimental basis. So it was uh, interferon and rivavirin, the first generation. So I was the whole time doing the treatment. So I was a bit, uh, sometimes I was really feeling uh, sick and, uh, so I had lost memory of, of something. After when I saw the saw it again, then things came back to me. Just one more question for me. Um, I was wondering if you were thinking about there is a sort of a very long tradition of um, in cinema about, about um, films about about fishermen and uh, sort of you know just this, the looking at fishermen and their way of life and the community and. Um, I think it's actually, uh, I'm thinking of also, there's a great Portuguese film by Paulo Rocha that has that. Uh, it, yes. As uh, a background. I'm wondering if you were thinking in, about this film and deciding to make a film about this community in relation to any of these films? Actually, it's um, uh, the, the footage you see here in black and white. Paulo Rocha uh, has this, uh, his second film, it's, I think it's from maybe 63, 64, I'm not certain was shot uh, in the same place where you see this black and white footage. Uh, because actually we come from this, uh, we lived in the same village. So I was six when he was shooting that film. It was the first uh, film shooting that I ever saw, which was very, I was very curious about it. And at the same time, uh, the film has some it's a fiction, it's a, it's a total fiction, but you have some parts of the film which are like documentary stuff. And, uh, and the black and white footage is, uh, you see here, it's done in the same beach by my father and a friend of his with an 8 millimeter camera. By that time, by the same time, he was more or less the same time he was shooting. So we, uh, we found this uh, 8 millimeter. So uh, that was my childhood, I actually, uh, my colleagues at school, uh, at primary school, were all uh, sons of fishermen, so maybe that's one of the reasons why I had some attachment to these people, because maybe it reminded me something also of my early experiences, I don't know. The first time I got really drunk, when I was like six, was with... Uh, <laughs> was uh, with... Uh, because you, I don't know if it was even today, but sometimes uh, when I was a kid, if, uh, if kids used to make a lot of noise, somebody, sometimes they gave them wine. Right. And uh, so I was with a, uh, with a friend of mine, it was my first, I was six, it was my first time at school, and uh, we were very excited, I, uh, so I went to his place, he was the son of a fisherman, and that day the mother put the, uh, a bowl of uh, red wine in front of me, and my memory is, is rolling down the dunes in the beach, uh, very happy. 
<laughs> Take some questions from the audience. Yeah, I'll start at the back. Just uh, how did you get your underwater cameraman in and out of the water without disturbing the uh, process of the fishing? Well, my uh, the underwater camera uh, was uh, Nunu actually. We uh, so uh, he he didn't have any diving experience. So uh, what we did, uh, we were there as as you've seen. We were there uh, for the first time with Pedro, uh, the, the the first block of the film, and then we had to go back uh, because uh, we worked uh, as uh, sound mixers. So we had uh, a film to do in uh, uh, with Andre Tessinet in Spain and Morocco. So we went. Uh, back to shoot this film, where we were working as technicians. And uh, after that period, Nunu went and did a, a diving course to, uh, so that we could shoot the film, because for us it made sense to show what happens above and below the water. But he had no experience at all. So uh, uh, he tried not to be, how do you say, obtrusive. But uh, actually, sometimes I think he was quite unconscious, because we were in open sea, and uh, he was driving alone, so we, we had nobody with us. Uh, but uh, we, we never felt that we were sort of uh, stopping them from fishing, or... Uh, actually, they were the ones who set the pace in the film. We, we, we tried to not disturb uh, at all uh, their activity. So, I don't... I don't, maybe for, if Nunu was here, he could tell you more because he was the one who was underwater. Um, uh, we know a lot about your life from the last documentary, the beautiful documentary. And I wondered how the changes that we saw in your life uh, in that film impacts when you go back and look at footage and put together the film for today? Uh, in a way, I think it might have uh, had some uh, impact in the way we... not so much as we edited it, uh, but... Uh, uh, because actually it's not so different from the first version we, we've shown to, to Portuguese television back then, when they told us uh, to eliminate scenes and cut it. But uh, at least one thing, I'm sure it, uh, it, uh, it made us uh, do it, was the idea of putting in some uh, big per personal pictures we had from the period. Uh, and we thought, uh, why not? I mean, if, if we're so present in the film, in the, in the commentary, why not uh, showing ourselves? Because actually, we were not shooting ourselves during the shooting. Mm -hmm. So you see us in these uh, uh, still images, which were like uh, private uh, pictures. And we thought it might make it made sense to include us in those sequences. So I think, yes, in a way, it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it gave us uh, maybe, uh, it fred us, uh, how, how could I say, uh, maybe we, if, if it wasn't that, maybe we, we, we would be more, not as free uh, in the way we approached it, probably. Okay. participants were with you and Nuno, Nuno. Um, it seems like that they were very trusting and comfortable, but then, you know, also the, what you document is, is a very traditional community, so I'm wondering, um, were people resistant to, of you in the Azores, you and Nuno, because you were gay, or um, how how did you build trust with, with your participants? And, like, I didn't get a sense of them ever really 
existing uh, theory or in the Actually, um, I, I don't know exactly how to, well, I think probably in uh, uh, these sort of communities, people, uh, in a way, they can be more close, but at the same time, they can be much more open than if you go to uh, like a middle cl class uh, group of people. For instance, it's quite funny because I'm not saying, uh, um, because you, 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 you can, for instance, that in Rathpais, you have uh, uh, some people who are uh, not only gay, but some fishermen, fishermen who are very uh, feminine in the way they, they uh, even that they go fishing and in weekends they can go in drag, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and it's quite funny because, uh, I mean, nobody cares, but uh, women are very afraid of them because uh, they can be, they can, they, they like to read uh, your hands and uh, sometimes they can be uh, daring. So, uh, but at the same time, I imagine that, for instance, for some people, uh, well, I'm, they also, the, the last film, there. And when, uh, we, when we were there, uh, they knew that we were two guys who lived together, so uh -huh. nobody, uh, that was not a secret for anybody. And it was never a problem uh, in the way uh, we, uh, we related to each other. Actually, they, I think they were very open and the, I don't know the details about their life, but it's quite funny because um, you see, the, there are two younger brothers in this uh, in this uh, family. Artur's, Artur has uh, a lot of kids, so the the small kid and the other one who's a bit uh, bigger, the one who, who carries him in the back. When uh, I had lost touch of, uh, uh, with the, with them, and when uh, Yegor Lembram came out. It was quite funny because uh, he, um, he, he got in touch with us saying, it's okay, I've seen the film, I liked it a lot, just to tell you that I'm gay. So I was, uh, and it's not easy here, sometimes it's not easy. But uh, because my mother, the, my mother, Art, uh, Artur's wife, that you don't, you don't see her in the film, you just see her in one picture, and, and she's very religious. Uh, my mother sometimes uh, it's a problem she doesn't accept it. So what I did, what we did, we sent a book to her mother uh, and uh, I think it helped change, the, change a bit uh, the way they, at least she accepts it, which is a book that we, we also have a, a publishing company, a small independent publishing company. I don't know, probably here it's com completely unknown. And no, I don't know if anyone of you knows uh, uh, Teresa Forcades. You never heard about this woman? Teresa Forcades, can I speak a little bit? Or yes. Teresa Forcades, is, she's a nun uh, from Barcelona. And, but actually she was a medical doctor. And uh, actually she did uh, uh, her doctorate here in, in the United States. And then she studied theology. And late in life, she suddenly, at the moment in her life, she decided to become a nun. But she's very, very radical. And, uh, and she's very supportive of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say gay rights, but uh, probably uh, she's, she stands with, she has very strong, uh, Actually, the, the conservative, now probably they stopped with the new pope, but before the conservative elements in Catholic Church, they, they made uh, a lot of movements to try to expel her from church because she has very radical positions. And she wrote a really interesting book 
called uh, Feminist Theology in History uh, that we published in Portugal, uh, the, the Portuguese version. And one chapter is uh, uh, about uh, uh, church uh, uh, relationship with uh, uh, homosexuality. And it's very sharp and clever. So we sent the book to her mother and it helped. <laughs> I think it changed her mind. You know. Please. Jack, so the story you just told is along the lines of what I was going to ask you. It feels to me that your films are so generous um, and transparent and open. The way that you approach the book seems to me that it's very much the way that you approach life. So you, uh, you allow me to experience so many things as you experience in them. And, um, you know, the way that you um, you get so involved in the community, and you, you want to live there for a year, and then you help them, you know, with, with whatever it is that they need, whether with exams or with, like, guiding courses. And, um, and in a way, the way that your relationship with Nuno also permeates the films that you make. Um, it's been very um, helpful and therapeutic for me and for many people I know. So I wanted to ask you what's your relationship with cinema in, in that realm, in terms of uh, therapy. Um, do you ever think about it in that way, or does it help you when you're going through processes? Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm. Well, first of all, I would like to tell you that maybe, I don't know, I can't have a, a sort of a cold, detached view from the films because when you make it, when you make a film, it's you're in a way involved, so you cannot be totally. Uh, but one thing we didn't want at all to do with with this film was uh, to get into their in, into the details of their personal life, like to uh, exploit. Uh, Whatever, so we, we, we want it to be, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if the word is respectful, but at least to uh, keep their privacy uh, uh, so that you feel their characters, but uh, we're not intruding in their lives. And that was one of the things we wanted to, to do with this film. Uh, what I can say is that every film we've done, and we haven't done a lot of films, but uh, uh, the, the, the films we've done, the, 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 every, every single one of them has changed our lives in a way. We we, sh we were with them actually more or less one year shooting, and then we couldn't leave the place, so we stayed for seven years. And uh, um, so there was, uh, and actually we thought we're not going to do another film. We did a, a, an animation film uh, there in the Azores, uh, Pasico, drawing animation, but uh, for us it was more important to maybe to, to leave mm -hmm. than to uh, to be sure. Uh, we're not, we don't, we're not doing films because we're filmmakers or something. We just do it when we feel it makes some sense, otherwise we do other things. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, they, they have been useful, yes, they have been important for our lives. For instance, uh, after this film, we, uh, there were some other fishing guards that are disappearing and, and that actually hadn't, uh, were not with these people, so we, we kept it on tape and gave it to them so that they keep it as a record when it, it disappears. And we did something which uh, was quite useful and that we, we're not showing it because it was really done for them. So we, we, we realized that one of the big problems uh, uh, was not only that uh, we, there, were, there, there were and there still are a lot of accidents because as you, as you can see the weather changes a lot in the Azores. So sometimes they go out and they, they can get, like the first time we, we didn't show it here, but the first time we go out with them for swordfish uh, at Christmas, uh, it was very quiet, and uh, suddenly we were caught in a storm. So we, we couldn't come back to Rathbeis. We had to go all around the island, 
so it took us like one day to be able to get to the port on the south of the island. So I, we almost basically got out of the, sh of the boat and went running to the airport because we were almost missed our flight. So we understood that there was a big problem with, with safety. First of all, nobody uses, as you, as you see, they don't have, uh, how do you say, life, life, life jackets. They don't have uh, this uh, inflatable. So, um, and when you have an accident there, people just uh, disappear. So nobody tells, nobody's there to tell what the problem is. They just, they're just uh, gone. So we did, after we did this film, we spent another year doing a, a film on uh, safety at sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so about the different problems, what can happen and how to deal like, when there's a fire on board, the mm. different situations. So what, what we did, since you do, some things we shot with them, what we could do, and some things you can't shoot because you need the, so we, we, we found out that there is a very good fishing school in Galicia, in the north of Spain. So we met the, the, the woman who runs the school, and they have all these simulators for fire on board, for like one of these huge pools where they can do big waves, you know. So uh, Nunu went there, and we, shoot, we shot all these situations in these simulators and then edit it like if it was a real situation. And we got some funding, and uh, we bought uh, life jackets for everybody. So every crew uh, had a, a DVD and life jackets. And it changed, it actually changed something. So it was, uh, in a way it was, uh, uh, it took us some time, but it was useful. It, Made, it made sense, and now they all, for instance, today they all have uh, these basic things, they all use these things. We have time for a final question, if there is one. Yes? You say uh, swordfish is that an domesticated fish captured by an domesticated people. Uh, I wonder now how it feels to be back in a country where people are domesticated. I didn't understand, sorry. My question was as, prov as provocative as, as the opportunity. <laughs> yes. My question to you is, how is it to be back in a country where people are so domesticated? You're talking about Portugal? Your, yes. <laughs> I don't know if everybody is domesticated in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some people, hopefully, are not domesticated. These people are not domesticated. I don't think that uh, uh, people in Rabbis have been domesticated yet. But uh, maybe this will lead, lead us to another, to another discussion. But I don't think everybody in Portugal is domesticated. If, I don't know if you, uh, when you're saying domesticated, exactly what you mean. Gentrified? S sorry? It's in the subtitles of the film you use, the translation says, talks about domesticated people. Yes. And so, is that a correct translation? Actually, it is. Then that's, I think I that's, that's what that's he's what talking about. Yes. But, but, and I think it's not, uh, it's general, the problem of uh, domestication. It's a, it's a process everywhere. It's not only in Portugal. Well, I think you also meant pen, you know, like, you know, salmon that's actually farmed, you know, yes. and contained. Yes. And I think that, you know, in the sense you're using the word in the sense of being free. Yes, okay. yes. Well, also the natural man as opposed to the sophisticated urban man. Is that part of it as well? Uh, maybe close to nature. Maybe closer to, nat uh, to nature, because I, I don't know if I c we can talk about natural man. I, I think <laughs> man is a cultural... But in a way, it's at least closer to some, uh, uh, in some degree, to have uh, some uh, 
power about uh, their decisions and their life in a way. Has, uh, has, All right, well, Jim, quick has, has global uh, the climate change affected the fishermen in this area? Do you a know? Lot, a lot. A lot, yeah. Uh, what they tell me is that uh, they get uh, 30 to 40 percent less catches today than they uh, had 15 years ago. Yes, mm. it changed a lot. Thank so you. it's a real problem. And, uh, the, the average wage, uh, what they're making, uh, uh, fishermen today is less than they did then, than what much less than what they did that, uh, by then. They the, the I think last year the average wage is less than uh, 400 euro a month. So probably 400 dollars, which is. Very little, but you you get people in the middle who, who make a lot of profit out of it. And even there, we we don't show it in the film, but uh, there are a few families who are very very rich because uh, they're the ones who who export the fish and they make a lot of money. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for about Turkey. Thank you. It's always really special to have you on.